the true story of how one man, with the assistance of two retired military officers, bluffed President Richard Nixon into ending the war in Vietnam, a presentation of Publius Productions. Permission is granted to make copies of this presentation. For the record, it was delivered on August the 15th, 2014. This is Ralph Epperson and I would like to tell you the story of what I consider to be the most important part of the entire war of Vietnam. I would like you to know that I personally believe that this story that I will tell is true. Someone sent me a copy of a booklet by Nord Davis entitled Rolling Thunder that contained his story about a dredge in Vietnam. I read it and was deeply impressed with its details. I wrote to Mr. Davis on September 1st, 1987 and asked him if he would call me at his convenience and he did. I asked him if he would permit me to tape the conversation and he consented. We talked for about an hour. I've used this tape recording and all of his other writings on the subject to detail what I'm about to relay to you now. Because this is a story of how one man who got the support of two more individuals ended the war in Vietnam years before it was supposed to end. I would like to ask each of you watching this DVD to be a member of a jury. And as a jury member, you would be advised to listen to all of the evidence presented before you reach a verdict. That means you must be open, and I can ask no more of you than that. Because as far as I know, this story has not been made public except by the man who originated it and then by me for the first time in 1992. And I believe it is a fair question to ask as to why I'm making this DVD about a war that ended in about 1975. And the answer to the question was stated in this quote attributed to the poet and philosopher George Santayana. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. The combat portion of the war was fought for about eight years, from 1964 to about 1972, and was apparently considered to be a war that was unwinnable. And just about 18 years after the war ended, America was involved in a war in Iraq, and later in another war in Afghanistan, when those wars are still being fought. So America did not learn from the war in Vietnam, and we are now at war in Iraq and Afghanistan. And just like the wars in Vietnam, these wars have been prolonged for lengthy periods. So I'm asking you again that you hear all of what I'm about to tell you before you decide whether or not this man's tr story is true. But first I must briefly cover the war in Vietnam itself as a foundation for the story of the dredge. Vietnam was a country divided into a north and a south around 1945 after the end of World War II. The communists were allowed to rule the north and a pro-capitalist government was allowed to function in South Vietnam. America's direct involvement started in 1964 after it was reported that North Vietnamese patrol boats attacked an American destroyer in the Gulf of Tonkin. It was claimed by the American government that the ship was in international waters, so this was presumed to be an attack by an enemy which would lead to war. I fir must first of all explain that this attack did not happen. I've documented that for the first time in 1992 in my four-hour DVD entitled Vietnam, America's Betrayal and Treason, of which this study on the dredge is but a part. Finally, for those of you who have the ability to get on the internet 
Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara admitted on a three-minute, 34 seconds clip available on YouTube entitled Gulf of Tonkin, McNamara admits it didn't happen. But as a result of this alleged attack, America increased its military presence in Vietnam by sending in armed soldiers and by supplying the South Vietnamese with arms and supplies. The communist nations of Russia and China started supplying, supplying war-making technology to the North Vietnamese government, while the South was financed and equipped by the United States, and the war between these world powers started. America's intelligence efforts developed the information that at least 80% of North Vietnam's war-making technology entered that nation through this one C port, the port of Haiphong. As you can see, the port is near the Gulf of Tonkin and is the only port in the nation deep enough to allow ocean-going vessels to enter the area and unload their cargo. This is an article that shows just how important this port was. It says here that there were 36 ships in the harbor at one time, meaning this must have been a huge port well capable of handling huge cargoes of war-making technology. This is a map of the city of Haiphong in the lower right. The blue line leading off into the northwest is called the Red River, and it is called that because it is very muddy, carrying tons of mud into the port each day. The North Vietnamese has, have purchased a dredge that operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week, removing the mud which clogs the port. Mr. Davis reported on page 46 of his booklet that without the dredge in Vietnam operating every day, the harbor would be closed within a matter of a few days because of the buildup of the mud. Now any general who wants to win a war knows that the way to do so is by cutting off the supplies of the enemy. And when you know that 80% of the enemy's supplies come through one port, and that this port has a dredge to keep the port open, it would follow then that it is imperative to sink the dredge to allow the port to silt up, and the enemy would then have no way of getting the supplies necessary to wage the war. You could end the war by silting up the harbor of Haiphong by sinking one dredge. Mr. Davis reported on page 47 of his booklet that two ships were sunk in the harbor during an air raid during World War II. Those ships blocked all access to the harbor so that not a single ship entered or left Haiphong Harbor for the duration of the war. But the American government made no attempt to sink the war during the entirety of the Vietnamese War. These are the Pentagon Papers which were commissioned by Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara in 1967, after the war had started in 1964, and were made public in 1971. They covered the period of 1945 to 1967, which were the years when the war was planned, to about three years after it started in 1964. They were released by Daniel Ellsberg, a top military analyst who became disillusioned with the war policy of the Pentagon. They were classified top secret at the time, and Perry Russo assisted in their release. This article discusses his action and was published upon his death. They report that the planners started talking about the mining or the blockading of the port of Haiphong in 1954, several years after the war planning started in at least 1945. This is page 445, and it says that the closure of Haiphong was not acceptable because they concluded that the closure of the port was bound to risk a confrontation with communist Russia. You see, if we, if we get the Russians mad, they might threaten us with a nuclear war, and that is such a frightening thought that 
we, 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 we wouldn't want that to happen. So we don't want to blockade the port of Haiphong. In 2002, I met a retired Navy, Navy officer who was a medical doctor assigned to the Ticonderoga aircraft carrier during the early years of the war. He reported to me that he had learned that the pilots on board were being trained to drop mines into the harbor of Haiphong. This was sometime between 1963 and 1965, just around the time that President Lyndon Johnson lied to us about the Gulf of Tonkin incident. The doctor added that these pilots were never ordered to accomplish this task. But there were others who decided that the port should be closed and that if this occurred, the war would come to a hasty conclusion. In March of 1968, Science and Mechanics magazine interviewed nine top military officers in all three branches of the military. And they unanimously concluded the war can be won in six weeks. They concluded that there were four things to do to win the war. Number one, officially declare war on North Vietnam. This would commit the entire resources of the United States to a victory. After the Gulf of Tonkin incident, Congress did not declare war on North Vietnam, a constitutional power that the Founding Fathers gave to Congress. A formal declaration of war was approved by Congress prior to our, to our entry into World Wars I and II. Congress only gave President Johnson the powers to involve, involve our government in a war. So the United States never formally declared war against North Vietnam. Number two, we should destroy all targets of consequence. I will not spend time on this strategy, but I can assure you only a small percentage of the targets deemed to be essential were attacked during the war. I cover this with more detailed specifics in my four-hour DVD entitled Vietnam, America's Betrayal and Treason. Number three, warn Communist China and Communist Russia to halt all shipments of war supplies to Communist North Vietnam. As we have seen, this was never done either. We did not tell these nations to not become involved in the war and they did. And number four, close the port of Haiphong. And this certainly wasn't done either. These retired military officers know that the way to win a war was to cut off the supplies of the enemy. And in the case of the Vietnamese war, that was to sink the dredge in the port of Haiphong. It would seem that only retired military officers are able to figure that out. Civilian pussy planters cannot be expected to think of these very complex solutions on their own. And notice this. If you closed the port of Haiphong, you wouldn't have to do the other three things. The war would be over. So the solution to a war is simply... You win it by winning it. You do those things that will give your troops a victory at the lowest possible cost in human life. And the way to do this in the Vietnam War was to sink one dredge. Now I want to explain a major deficiency in America's plans for waging this war. It was not, not planned by the military. It was planned by the President and the Secretary of Defense and his Department of Bureaucrats. So how this war was fought was in the hands of civilians and not the military. And it was their decision not to sink the dredge. But I must admit that some military officers on active duty did wish to do so. Admiral U.S. Grant Sharp, 
the commander of the Pacific Fleet said we should have closed the harbor of Haiphong. This was a great mistake, of course. And it immeasurably increased the casualties that our side suffered. The failure to close the port killed America's fighting forces. These are harsh words, but they are also extremely accurate. In 1968, General Earl Wheeler, a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, submitted a bombing policy paper to President Johnson. Senator Barry Goldwater reported on what that paper said. General Wheeler would favor action to close the port of Haiphong. Then Goldwater told us why President Johnson did not carry out General Wheeler's recommendation. The general had received word that closing the port was not an action President Johnson was going to consider. So now the question to be asked becomes this. Why did Johnson not close the port? And the answer is that victory was not an option in the war. We were not in this war to win it. In a book about Air Force General Curtis LeMay, the Air Force Chief of Staff during the war, entitled Iron Eagle, the author tells us what General LeMay would have done to win the war. He, the general, would have mined the harbor of Haiphong. Now the next question to be answered must be this one. Why didn't these top military officers do this while they were on active duty during the war? They had the power. The armed forces know that when admirals and generals speak, others obey. But most people do not know that generals and admirals obey orders as well. Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution of the United States says, The President shall be Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces. That means that the President issues orders to Admirals and Generals, and America's Admirals and Generals know that they had best obey them. Presidents, and not Generals or Admirals, are the ones who decide to sink dredges. And who were the Commanders-in-Chief during the war? There were two and only two. Lyndon Johnson from the start of the war until 1969 when Richard Nixon became president. Finally, on May the 8th, 1972, President Nixon took steps to end the war. He went on nationwide television and told the American people, there is only one way to stop the killing and that is to keep the weapons out of North Vietnam. Now, now, how did Nixon propose to keep the weapons out of North Vietnam? He announced plans to drop mines into the port of Haiphong. Nixon had figured it out. But notice that there is an even bigger question to ask. Why did it take him nearly four years to take this action? Why in 1972 and not 1971 or 1970 or 1969 after he was inaugurated as president? And notice this. We were told that the reason we did not sink the dredge was because it might cause Russia to threaten America with a nuclear war. But notice that President Nixon did not seem too concerned that the action would provo provoke a confrontation with communist Russia. And if he should have been, nothing happened. The Soviet Union did not threaten America with a nuclear war. Remember, this was the reason that the government planners had issued the rules of engagement and had not closed the port before 1972.
So Richard Nixon then warned the nations with ships in the port that they had four days to get their ships out of the port before he dropped the mines. Now which nations did he notify? Why, of course, the two nations of Communist Russia and Communist China, because they had ships in the port of Haiphong in Communist North Vietnam. This is a photograph of a Russian ship unloading materials in the Haiphong Harbor, for example. And then he notified all of the other communist nations who were aiding communist North Vietnam in this war by shipping war-making goods into North Vietnam. This war was very clear. It was a war between the communist nations against the capitalist nations of the United States. So these other nations had chosen up sides and had sided with their fellow communist nations. So Richard Nixon sent notice to these communist nations to get their ships out of the port. England, Japan, Greece, Norway, Italy, and West Germany. These were the other communist nations who decided to support the war effort of their fellow communist nations instead of the United States. This is a list of some of those nations and the names of the ships they were using to ship goods into Vietnam to kill Americans. This, for instance, is the list of the 15 Norwegian ships which were sailing to Haiphong to unload goods to kill Americans. But these nations were not our enemies, they were our allies. Who needs enemies when you have friends like these? Now there was one more communist nation that had its ships in the port of Haiphong, and President Nixon had to warn this communist nation as well. That nation was the communist nation of the United States. I would now like to quote a recognized expert on America's military aid to communist Russia. His name is Antony Sutton and he wrote this book amongst six others. National Suicide, Military Aid to the Soviet Union, published 1973. These are his comments on page 33. Trade with the Soviet Union from 1917. Now, that would, by the way, that was the year that the communists took over the government of Russia. This trade has built the free world an enemy of the first order. The technological component of this trade enables Russia to supply the North Vietnamese invasion of the South. In other words, Russia was supplying North Vietnam with technology provided them by the United States. This is another book written by Mr. Sutton on the same subject, entitled The Best Enemy Money Can Buy, published in 1986. These are his comments from page 199. There is no such thing as Soviet technology. Almost all, perhaps 90 to 95 percent, came directly or indirectly from the United States and its allies. In effect, the United States and the NATO countries have built the Soviet Union. Its industrial and military capabilities. As part of his research, Mr. Sutton looked into all of the Russian ships sailing into the port of Haiphong during the Vietnamese War. He identified 100 of Russia's ships, including five Liberty ships that America had lent or leased to Russia during World War II under a program called Lend-Lease. That program totaled nearly $10 billion American dollars in war-making technology. 
This is a photograph that shows one of the last Liberty ships built during World War II somewhere on the Sacramento River in California in a mothball fleet being kept so that it could be used again in a war emergency. The United States built hundreds of these ships to a common plan to quickly get ships into the water to carry goods to our troops in World War II. And the United States lent or leased Russia 121 merchant vessels, some of which were presumably Liberty ships. Notice that the program was called Land Lease, which means that these ships were not gifts. They were either lent or leased to the communist nation of Russia, which means that these ships were flying the Russian flag and were being used to carry goods into Haiphong to kill Americans and they still legally belonged to the United States. I can remember reading about some people who warned the American government about this lend lease program during World War II that it would come back to haunt the American people. And here is some evidence that it did come back to haunt us just a few years later when American ships were being used by communist Russia to kill Americans. By the way, should you wish to see a list of the goods that this $10 billion lend lease program sent to Russia, you can on pages 83 to 108 in this book entitled From Major Jordan's Diaries. But during World War II, the communist nation was our ally. How could we have known that it would turn against us in the Vietnam War? And the answer is simple. They were a communist nation and are still a communist nation. And communists are out to destroy the capitalist system. So they were doing what they were expected to do. And that was to choose to kill American soldiers with technology that was supplied to them by the United States. As I said on May the 8th, 1972, Richard Nixon announced the plans to end the war in Vietnam. The bloody war was coming to an end. But it is an interesting question as to why he chose that particular day. Because it was not President Nixon who ended the war. Neither was it Henry Kissinger, our Secretary of State. Neither was it Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara. Neither was it Congress. Neither was it the media. Neither was it the anti-war protesters. It was this man, Nord Davis, of Topton, North Carolina. Mr. Davis held a senior executive position with the International Business Machine Company, abbreviated to the initials of IBM, until he resigned in 1966 because of IBM's sale of advanced computers to the communist nation known as Russia. He had started a small patriotic newsletter sometime before he resigned, and it was one of his articles in a booklet form that was sent to me by a mutual friend that prompted my letter to him on September the 1st, 1987. I introduced myself to him, as I said, and I asked him to call me, and we talked on the phone a short time later. That was when I obtained many of the details of his incredible story about this war in Vietnam. Now let me remind you once again that you are on a jury and as such you have to hear all of the evidence before you reach a verdict. I'm about to tell you his story, one that I believe is true. And I believe that you will as well after you hear the evidence. Mr. Davis learned about the dredge in the Port of Haiphong in 1971 and decided it was the key to a victory in Vietnam. He decided to conduct a private war against the dredge since the government would not do so. 
he decided to sink it and end the war in Vietnam. He raised $100,000 in pledges and offered it as a payment to any American pilot who would sink it himself. He printed up over 100,000 of these flyers and had them delivered to American Air Force bases all over South Vietnam. It told the pilot that if he would sink the dredge and then be able to prove it with photographs, he would receive the $100,000 in cash. Mr. Davis said that hundreds of pilots called him for further information. And he told me that he told them that any of them could end the war and that they could go home earlier if they sank the dredge. And the typical response was that the Port of Haiphong was not on the approved target list of the planners in Washington, D.C. And in fact, it was specifically off limits for American pilots to even fly over it. And I would be remiss if I did not inform you of the second reason Haiphong was not on the approved target list. Mr. Davis reported on page 49 that he had become aware of the Standard Oil Refinery was in Haiphong and it supplied gasoline and oil to both North and South Vietnam at the same time. And now we know that there were two important reasons to make Haiphong off limits to American soldiers and pilots. Of course, the dredge in the harbor and the standard oil refinery in the city. Now let me return to the responses of the American pilots about why they could not sink the dredge. The pilots reminded Mr. Davis that if one of them sank the dredge, he would violate the rules of engagement which were drawn up by the planners in Washington, D.C. And if he did that, he would be subject to a court-martial. And if he was court-martialed, he would lose his military pension. And that if he lost his pension, he would have no future. And Mr. Davis explained that if the pilot were to sink the dredge, it would end the war and countless lives of American fighting men would be saved. And hundreds of American pilots stated that it was not enough money. And I find this response to be absolutely incredible. These pilots refused to do what was right after they learned what the solution to the war in Vietnam was. Sinking the dredge to clog up the harbor of Haiphong to cut off 80% of the war material being used by the North Vietnamese to kill Americans. Finally, in December of 1971, a retired Air Force colonel named Granville Wright called Mr. Davis and asked if he would get the money if he sank the dredge. Colonel Wright was a retired Vietnam veteran who spoke Vietnamese and he could get into Haiphong and do as requested. Mr. Davis asked him how he, as one man, could sink the dredge, and he explained that he would swim out to the dredge and plant timed explosives that would sink it after he swam away. Mr. Davis said that he would gladly give him the $100,000 if he could prove that he sank the dredge. Colonel Rideout turned to some research to find out all that he could about the dredge in Haiphong. He discovered that it had built, been built as one of three by a company in Singapore for a dredge in that city, along with another one that was sold to a company in Hong Kong. Mr. Davis raised $6,000 to finance a trip where the colonel was hoping he could physically examine the dredge and hopefully the plans of the dredge itself. He contacted the builder of the dredges, telling them that he needed a dredge for a business venture of his in America, and they bought, they brought, they brought out the plans for the dredge and laid them on a table. Mr. Rideout observed that the dredge had eight watertight compartments under the waterline, and that one man could not carry enough explosives 
to sink the dredge. He then arranged to take a boat to get close to the dredge and he took this photograph. He returned to North Carolina and told Mr. Davis what he had learned. Colonel Rideout then explained that the only way it could be sunk was by bombing it. Nord explained that he had tried that approach and that no American pilot was willing to assume the task of sinking the dredge. The colonel then told Mr. Davis that he knew where two B-26 attack bombers were sitting in some airport in Laos. The B-26 was a World War II low-level bomber, meaning it could be flown low to the ground to avoid radar detection and it would be ideal for the task assigned to it. These two airplanes have been given to Laos by the government of the United States to assist them in some sort of drug war and that he thought they could be purchased on auction. The colonel went to the Laotian government and purchased each of the two planes <laughs> for $500 apiece. North, North Davis now owned an Air Force. The two of them then worked out the details of the attack. The plans called for the two planes, one after the other, to fly on the route of this map. The planes would leave Laos on the left, fly due east across the majority of the nation into the Gulf of Tonkin, and then fly north and then northwest into the port. Each bomber would make one pass and hope that one or both could sink the dredge. They knew that they couldn't have their planes stay around and keep making bombing repeated runs until they sank it. So they decided that each airplane would have to carry one bomb each capable of sinking it by itself. The plan further stated that the second plane would take off 45 minutes after the first unless the first had sunk the dredge. They planned on making the run between the 1st and 7th of May 1972 because there would be a quarter moon out and that its light would assist the low-level bombers in seeing the target. They discovered that the United States Air Force did indeed have a bomb that would be capable of sinking the dredge by itself and it was called a 500 pound bomb. The colonel said that he knew a retired Marine Corps general named Pedro Del Valle and that he might be able to assist them in getting the two 500 pound bombs to the airport in Laos. He then called the general and explained the plan to him. The general said he would assist by seeing if he could obtain the bombs by calling generals in the Air Force in Vietnam who were friends of his, and he did. But all of these generals turned him down because they said that they could not transport bombs to an airport in a neutral nation. It was about this time that they learned that even if they could get the bombs, the doors on the bomb bay of the B-26, they would have to be enlarged to drop the bombs because they were too small to allow the passage of the bomb to the target. They were this close and they could not complete the job. And then General Del Valle suggested that they should bluff the government by claiming that they would sink the dredge if the U.S. did not, and then hope that this would force the United States into sinking it. General Del Valle said that he knew Admiral John McCain, the father of the Arizona Senator John McCain, who was the commander of all the naval forces in the Pacific Fleet. Del Valle wrote a letter asking the Admiral to meet with Colonel Rideout as a personal favor to him. And on April the 28th, 1972, Rideout flew to Hawaii, where Admiral McCain was headquartered, and met with his aide. Mr. Davis told me that the Admiral did not meet directly with the Colonel, quite possibly because he could deny that he had ever talked to Colonel Rideout if this story ever became public. Colonel Rideout told the aide that he knew that they, meaning he and the other others involved knew about the dredge in the port of Haiphong and that if the U.S. Air Force did not sink it by May the 7th 1972 they had the ability 
to do it themselves. And if he and his friends sunk the dredge, they would then go public with the information that the U.S. government would not sink it and that it took three American citizens to do the job and that would not look good to the Air Force or the Navy. Mr. Davis wrote, Can you imagine the anger of the American people if they learned that three men operating strictly on their own with no military support had accomplished almost single-handedly what the administration had failed to do in eight years. Colonel Rideout returned to the United States and met with Mr. Davis and the General. Mr. Davis told me that he had friends in the Pentagon and that they knew that Admiral McCain called Secretary of State Henry Kissinger and relayed what he had been told. Mr. Davis further explained that he was told that Mr. Kissinger had obtained the Colonel's Air Force records and discovered that the Colonel was highly recommended as an officer who did what he said he would do. So Kissinger apparently believed that there must be truth to his claim that he and the others would sink the dredge if the United States government did not do so. And he must have told President Nixon. And on May the 8th, 1972, President Nixon announced plans to drop mines into the harbor of Haiphong to effectively end the war in Vietnam. He went on national television and told the American people he was doing this to end the killing in the war. Mr. Davis sent me a newsletter entitled The Reaper, printed by an Air Force pilot stationed at Colorado Springs, Colorado, who told me that on May the 8th, 1972, when President Richard Nixon announced plans on dropping mines into the port of Haiphong, the pilot said that the Air Force went to DEFCON 3, an increase in force readiness above normal. That response reportedly included a 24-hour alert to the Air Force to watch for any planes flying into the area of Haiphong. They were further, or further ordered to shoot down any unauthorized plane in that vicinity. So if all of this was true, they met the deadline of Nord Davis, Colonel Rideout, and General Del Valle. So it was this one man with the assistance of two military officers who ended the war. And that man was Nord Davis. And America owes this very courageous and innovative American patriot an enormous debt of gratitude. Because he ended a war that probably was planned by the American government to go on for many years. He saved the lives of countless people in the area. So the bloody war was coming to an end, and on January the 23rd, 1973, the armistice was signed. And I have chosen to honor Mr. Davis and the two retired officers by telling their story about how he had an idea to end a war that our government did not want to win. Thank you very much, Mr. Davis. Your dedication to the cause of freedom must never be forgotten. And may God bless America. <laughs>